Okay, uh, I would like to welcome everyone to the uh, Active Aging in Manitoba's webinar entitled The Manitoba View on Flu, Prevention Options for Manitobans. I'm Jim Evanchuk, Executive Director of Active Aging in Manitoba, a not-for-profit organization dedicated to raising awareness about healthy aging choices and behaviors toward the achievement of optimal health for life. I will be the host of today's webinar, which will help you gain an understanding of influenza, its impact on Manitobans, and what you can do to protect yourself and others. Before we get started, I would like to thank Wellness Institute at Seven Oaks General Hospital for enabling Active Aging in Manitoba to host this webinar. Our Active Aging in Manitoba office is situated within the Wellness Institute, which has been in operation for over 20 years. And we continue to be collaborative partners in several active aging initiatives and projects. We are very fortunate to have a Manitoba expert on vaccines and immunization to present to us today. Today's webinar will be facilitated by Dr. Hild Tim Hilderman, who has practiced family medicine in rural Manitoba for a decade before entering specialty training in public health and preventative medicine at the University of Manitoba. Tim is the medical lead for vaccines at Manitoba Health, a medical officer of health in the Interlake Eastern Regional Health Authority, medical director of Interlake Eastern Travel Health Services, and an assistant professor in the University of Manitoba's Faculty of Health Sciences. He is active in vaccine and communicable disease control research. We are also very fortunate to have Peggy Prendergast, a retired teacher and octogenarian with us today to share her personal story on the benefits of getting the flu shot that is appropriate for you. I will introduce Peggy immediately following Dr. Hilderman's presentation. Uh, throughout uh, the webinar, you will ha have an opportunity to uh, ask any questions, and I, I will ask you, please put them in the chat box on the screen at any time during the presentation, and we'll address them at the end to keep the flow of the webinar. And now I will hand the microphone over to Dr. Hilderman. Thanks very much, Jim. <sighs> Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody, and, and thank you so much uh, to Jim and the Active Aging in Manitoba a group for asking me to uh, and giving me the opportunity and the privilege, really, of sitting here today to uh, to talk to you about uh, something that is uh, very near and dear to my heart, both as a, as a family physician originally and now as a public health and preventive medicine specialist. And that really is the importance of uh, influenza vaccination and uh, an opportunity to discuss um, what is uh, really a good problem to have, which is now a number of different choices uh, that are available um, to Manitobans in terms of influenza vaccine. So uh, just a little brief history about influenza vaccination. Um, influenza vaccination, really, the, the first successful vaccines were introduced post-World War II and were initially approved for, for military use and actually not available for public use. Um, if you fast forward kind of 40 years, uh, the, in Canada, we started introducing uh, inactivated flu vaccines uh, in, the, in the late 80s and early 90s. And in fact, when I started my family practice, we had one uh, flu vaccine available for use for all ages. And we really targeted uh, those above 65 and those with chronic conditions. Um, Fast forward to today, we now have nine different influenza vaccines that vary according to a whole number of different parameters, number of strains covered, indicated age, dose, route of administration, etc. So I'm going to just uh, uh, right off the hop say right out of the gate that the best way to prevent influenza is through the annual in, uh, influenza immunization. Uh, but there's a harsh reality, which is that the, the number of Manitobans over 65 years of age who get the flu shot or who got the flu shot uh, over the last couple of years has, is sitting at about 55%. That's actually a decrease um, over the last two decades in the number of, of those over 65 in Manitoba who are choosing to get the annual influenza vaccination. 
So we're gonna we're gonna uh, this is a great topic, and we could talk about any one of these uh, um, objectives for probably the whole time. So we're gonna have to to uh, to be brief in some of these areas, but we're gonna want to understand the signs and symptoms and mechanisms of spread of influenza virus today. Uh, increase awareness of the impact of influenza in Manitoba, particularly in older Manitobans. We want to understand the complications of, of influenza in the older adult population. Let's look at the different influenza vaccines that are available in Manitoba. We'll look at some strategies for overcoming what we call this influenza vaccine hesitancy, which is we think has resulted in some of the decreasing uptake in those over 65. And then we're going to look at some of the efficacy and economics of high dose vaccination to protect against influenza in the older adult population in Manitoba. So hopefully that sounds good with everybody. So first of all, what is influenza? So influenza is a contagious respiratory illness which is caused by influenza viruses that infect the nose, throat, and sometimes the lungs. You can be asymptomatic with the flu, that is not have any symptoms. You can have mild illness, or you can have severe illness, which can lead to hospitalization or death. So it really causes disease across the entire spectrum of possible clinical presentations. So what are the symptoms? So generally speaking, an, uh, influenza is different from a cold. So it, it usually comes on suddenly. You have People have the flu often feel some or all of these symptoms. So fever, cough, sore throat, runny or stuffy nose, body aches, headache, chills, fatigue. This is not just a mild cough or cold. This is, this is the feeling that you know, you've been hit by the truck. Um, the, there can be diarrhea and vomiting associated with influenza. This is not the stomach flu. Okay, the stomach flu is a different virus, all right? So what are the complications of the flu? So um, these tend to be what we call bacterial complications as a result of the body's immune system being worn down from, from uh, the influenza virus. So you have pneumonia, you have ear infections, sinus infections. You also get worsening of chronic medical conditions such as congestive heart failure, asthma, or diabetes. So influenza can and is a significant cause of disease. Who's at high, highest risk? Anyone can get influenza, even healthy people, young people. And serious problems related to flu can happen at any age. But there are those people that are at high risk of developing serious flu-related complications. <clears throat> Excuse me. This includes people 65 years of age and older, people of any age with certain chronic medical conditions, such as asthma, diabetes, or heart disease, and pregnant women and, young, and children younger than five years of age. So what about prevention? So as I, I started off the discussion today, the first and most important step in preventing flu is to get a flu vaccine each year. The, the immunity to influenza has to change because every year the virus changes. Unfortunately, we don't have a flu vaccine, which is a one and done flu vaccine. We don't have a flu vaccine, which we can give you once, let's say like a measles, mumps, rubella vaccine and give you lifelong protection. Flu vaccine has been shown to reduce flu-related illnesses and the risk of serious flu complications that can result in hospitalization or even death. Everyday preventive actions, which I, I'm a public health doc, so I like these things, you know, staying home when you're sick, staying away from people who are sick, covering coughs and sneezes, and frequent hand washing are important, but they're not enough. So what about flu vaccine? What is What, what about uh, burden of illness, we call this in public health? What kind of disease does it cause? So every year in Canada, influenza is, ranks among the top 10 leading causes of death. So at Canadian data tells us we see 12,200 hospital stays due to influenza every year, 3,500 deaths. And keep in mind that the influenza virus themselves represent only about 5% of circulating viruses in a population at any given time. So there's a lot of other viruses out there, but influenza is one that occurs seasonally and that, ha and that, and that causes serious potential health concerns. This is a really great slide. Jim, I'm glad you were able to fit this one in. Thank you so much. Of all the pictures, this is the one that I really wanted to show, so I really appreciate it. The, this is the flu virus. So I want you to pay attention when you look at the flu virus to those spikes that are coming out of it. Those spikes are what we call hemagglutinins and neuraminidase molecules. These are the H's and the N's. So when you hear H1N1, H3N2, influenza, what we're really talking about is the shape of those spikes. The shape of those spikes is what allows the influenza virus to infect us, our respiratory tract, our, our nose, our throat, and it is also what our immune system recognizes and attacks. So the vaccines that are out there 
basically all try to replicate those spikes so that when you get when your immune system sees those spikes as part of the flu vaccine when they actually see the virus you're ready with an immune response and an antibody response to respond to those those the this simple seems like a relatively simple odd picture but the the shape of those spikes changes ever so slightly every year if it's a slight change we call this a drift all right and that can be handled with changes to the existing vaccines every year if there's a major change in the shape of one of those spikes we call that a shift or, or rather a, an antigenic shift and a shift is what produces a pandemic so 1918 was a shift the 2009 pandemic was a shift these are significant changes in the shape of those spikes that your immune system hasn't previously seen and the only way to, to prevent infection with a, when you have a, a major change is with a, with a newer, different vaccine. So I wanna talk a little bit about influenza vaccine uh, acceptance. And you know, every year as healthcare providers, we see the devastation that influenza causes in our patients and facilities. We see the clinic and emergency department visits, the hospitalizations, the intensive care unit admissions the morbid morbidity and even potentially the death and mortality and yet most of us and when i'm this this was a part of a presentation i gave to healthcare workers most uh, healthcare workers do not immunize ourselves or the majority of our patients against influenza annually so why are we hesitant when we think about vaccine hesitancy all right, we talk about this continuum of vaccine acceptance and everybody who's joining us today on the webinar and those in the room here, it, when it comes to flu vaccine, it should be, you know, see where you sit along the spectrum. There are gonna be those people that refuse all flu vaccines, those people, for example, that refuse, but are unsure, those that will refuse some. So maybe certain years when they think the flu is bad or if it's a pandemic, they might do it. Um, uh, but uh, typically every year they don't. Uh, and then there's those that are, get the flu vaccine every year, but are unsure about it. And then there are those at the other end of the spectrum that get the flu vaccine every year regardless. So it's important to figure out where people lie on that, on this continuum. This is the World Health Organization uh, um, continuum of vaccine acceptance hesitancy. W what the current thinking is, is that people who um, are hesitant or choose not to, or are hesitant about getting the flu vaccine, um, it really can be sort of slotted into some combination of these three things. So we're, they're complacent. So a complacent individual doesn't feel threatened by the particular vaccine preventable infectious disease, in this case, influenza. Or there's a confidence issue. They have lack of confidence in the influenza vaccine, of its safety, of its effectiveness. And then the third is something that we do as humans and have done and evolved over thousands, tens of thousands of years, which is this risk assessment. So you kind of, you, you, you base a decision to do something on, on what you see the risk to be. You know, if we feel the risk is, is high, we tend to take action. If we feel the risk is low, we don't take action. So it's interesting. This slide, you got all the good slides in here, Jim. This is my favorite goal for the, the influenza vaccine is different. Uh, and I put this slide in there as a reminder. People think of the influenza vaccine as being different than say the polio vaccine, all right? And so I put the slide in here as a reminder that that for many reasons, our attitudes and beliefs uh, about influenza vaccine are different than some of those other more tr um, uh, traditional vaccines. So I've got, how are we doing for time here? Are we okay for time? We're gonna talk, there's, there's, there's been a lot of work done on, on understanding why people choose to receive influenza vaccine or not receive influenza vaccine. And this is just one really great article from Philip Schmidt and, uh, and his team um, at, uh, in, in Germany that, did, that looked at a lot of this data and tried to summarize why people would choose not to be immunized. So one of the things has to do with risk perception. So they perceive, people who don't um, immunize themselves against flu perceive the risk to be low. Um, and the, or we perceive the risk of, or the severity of the disease to be low. I put this uh, slide in here because uh, risk is really important to understand when we talk about influenza. So I think pretty much everybody would agree that running with scissors is pretty risky. And, uh, but uh, I, I felt it was important for people to define what we mean by risk. So when we're talking about risk due to influenza, we're talking about the possibility of loss or injury, all right? We're talking about hazard. And people's perception of that risk is really important in terms of informing their decision 
to immunize or to not immunize. The other thing that we find is really interesting, and this applies, uh, has probably always been true, but maybe more so true now in, in this connected world, is individuals who are in groups where there is low pressure to get vaccinated tend not to be vaccinated. So uh, if, if their families don't vaccinate, they tend not to vaccinate for, against flu. If their friends don't believe in vaccination, they, they tend not to be vaccinated. So what we're really seeing is that, is that if a social network, whether that was a, a, a direct contact or indirect through, a, through um, you know, other, other connected means, um, if you're in a group that doesn't believe in vaccination, you're less likely to be vaccinated. Conversely, um, people who are in peer groups that are, have a high level of acceptance of vaccine are more likely to, to, to immunize themselves. So some of these other features kind of make sense, but I think they're worth talking about anyways when we think about influenza vaccines. So people who have been vaccinated in the past are more likely to be vaccinated in the future. People who have not suffered from influenza previously or its complications are less likely to be vaccinated in the future. The other thing, in that, and this is what makes an opportunity that, that, that we've got today so important, is that lacking general knowledge about influenza and influenza vaccine is a barrier to vaccination. So we need to do a better, and I say we in my role in public health need to do a better job um, uh, uh, concerning educating individuals and, and addressing people's concerns about vaccines and influenza vaccines specifically. Um, you know, one of the common misconceptions is that in, in the past was that people didn't get vaccinated because they didn't have access to vaccination. You know, here in Manitoba now, we have more than a thousand providers that, that vaccinate physicians, pharmacists, public health nurses. And the, uh, the, the, the new data, the new thinking that's coming out is really that it has a lot to do with the fact for the most part, people who want to be and receive the vaccine can get reasonable access to the vaccine. So that access to the vaccine is not actually an issue. Oh, nice. I like this. So Thomas Fuller, and I, I, this, is a, this is a great quote uh, and great for us who work in prevention, which is health is, not vac is health is not valued till sickness comes. So Thomas Fuller, somebody I didn't really know a lot about, he was baptized June 19th in 1608, and he was an English churchman and historian, prolific author, and, and one of the first English writers to uh, actually make a living as a writer. So it, it, he, this is, uh, health is not valued till sickness comes, is one of his quotes. Several others that I think you might find interesting that are actually probably not related to this, but I can't resist. Uh, it's madness for sheep to talk peace with a wolf. One that would have the fruit must climb the tree. And uh, a good garden may have some weeds. So I'd like you to keep that last one in mind when you're uh, evaluating this presentation. All right. So, okay, enough of that. We're still, got, we're still okay? All right. So um, vaccine for preventing Ill influenza in healthy adults, does it work? Cochrane Review um, is a, is a uh, world authority and what are called systematic reviews of the literature and meta-analysis, which basically takes a look at all the data from multiple trials over years to try to pin down how effective uh, intervention is. So in this case, this review that they that started in 1999 was updated in 2018. They looked at the eff efficacy, the effectiveness and harm of vaccines against influenza in healthy adults aged 16 to 65. So they looked at 25 randomized control trials of the highest um, uh, uh, level of confidence, 70,000 plus participants from single influenza seasons, and it works. Bottom line is, inactivated influenza vaccines reduce influenza in healthy adults from 2.3% at a population level to 0.9%. So that's a crude reduction of 60%. All right, so uh, a lot of this discussion about is it effective, is it not effective, there are things definitely change annually, but if you look at it overall, this is an effective vaccine. What about older adults? And this kind of fits into the, the nature of the discussion today concerning new vaccines or emerging vaccines. So this is all, this was not including high dose. This is uh, eight RCTs, 5,000 participants, 65 plus with standard dose vaccine. And uh, it works as well. 42% reduction against lab confirmed influenza. But you will note that the effectiveness, the efficacy is lower in older adults. And that, that fact that it, it works, but is less effective than it is in younger adults tells us that there's an opportunity, all right, to improve 
to improve the coverage, the effectiveness of the vaccine. So, so when you think about it, you know, young adults, 60%, adults over 65, I still think are young, but uh, a decreasing effectiveness to about 40%, still effective, but less effective. And this is due to something that we call immunosenescence, which is our immune systems don't react to the vaccine as well as we get older. I include this slide because, you know, in public health over the last couple of years, and we seem to start apologizing for the fact that the flu vaccine isn't as effective as we think it is. So from CDC Atlanta, okay, and this is the quote, seat belts dramatically reduce the risk of death and serious injury among drivers and front seat passengers. Seat belts reduce the risk of death by 45%. Now I'm not equating the risk of death in a car accident to the risk of influenza. But what I am equating is the fact that we don't think twice about putting on our seat belts, all right? Yet their effectiveness is very similar to the effectiveness of flu vaccine. And in fact, in, in, in relative terms, flu vaccine is actually more effective at doing what it's supposed to do than seat belts are doing what they're supposed to do. And I'm just saying, a lot of this notion of the vaccine not being effective um, comes from a, um, media coverage and other things that don't actually accurately reflect this in terms of other public health interventions. So it's just an aside. Safety. So we've got, we get a lot of discussion, a lot of concerns about, about vaccine safety. I'm just going to spend one minute just briefly talking about all the things that we do to ensure flu vaccines are safe. Vaccine pharmacovigilance is the science of ensuring vaccine safety. All healthcare providers have pivotal roles as well as the public in terms of uh, gaining and maintaining public confidence in the safety of vaccines. Uh, pharmacovigilance is done by government regulators, the vaccine industry, public health officials, healthcare professionals, and, and consumers. It's done through a variety of different programs, safety reports, risk management plans, product risk benefit assessments, the Canadian Adverse Event Following Immunization Surveillance System, which I'm a part of, the Immunization Monitoring Program Active, which is called IMPACT. This is a pediatric-based um, program, which actively seeks out vaccine-related uh, impacts. So what does it tell us about the safety of influenza vaccine? So influenza vaccine, all right, um, is safe, is administered as an injection, so it can cause pain, there's no question. It can cause redness and swelling at the injection site, and it can also cause fever, malaise, and myalgias. It cannot cause influenza, all right? So we get this all the time. I got the flu vaccine, then I got influenza. There's two things that happen there. One is that you may have been exposed to the influenza vaccine before the vaccine had, or the influenza virus before the vaccine um, had a uh, opportunity to work for you. So you're getting influenza after you got influenza vaccine. It typically takes about two weeks after you receive the influenza vaccine to actually get adequate immunity to prevent the flu. All right. But the other thing is, like I remember I mentioned earlier, Influenza viruses only represent about 5% of the viruses that are out there. So there's a whole bunch of other nasty stuff out there that the flu vaccine is never going to protect against. All right. Um, and vaccine components on rare occasions can cause allergic reactions. All right. And so anybody who's giving a flu vaccine has to have the ability who's administering that to manage a rare allergic reaction that happens somewhere in the range of between one in 100,000 to one in, in a million doses administered. <laughs> We don't get it too much into the details here, but this is an example where the, the Guillain-Barre syndrome, which can, which can be a very serious neurological condition, has been linked to influenza vaccination over the years. And the, there's, a, there's, no, there's a little bit of debate as to whether it's a, a cause and effect thing or not, but there's, if, there, if there is a link between flu vaccine and getting this condition, it would, it's, it's to the order of you're having to deliver between one and two million flu vaccine doses to create a single excess case. The risk of developing this Guillain-Barre syndrome or GBS, all right, after influenza infection, all right, so this should actually read influenza infection is higher than this, okay? So, so simply not getting vaccinated, all right, um, increases your risk of getting uh, GBS beyond the risk associated with getting vaccinated. So yes, it's safe. Now let's talk about, we've got a few more minutes and we can talk about these, these options for 65 plus across Canada.
This last one, and, and Jim, if we're gonna, if the slides are gonna be up there, the live attenuated QIV we should uh, drop out of there. That's for two to 17 year olds that slipped in there from a previous presentation. So uh, the live attenuated QIV isn't available in, uh, in Manitoba for those 65 plus. It is available for those two to 17. That's actually the inhaled flu vaccine. That's the, the nasally inhaled. Okay, so what have we got here in available in Manitoba? Um, okay, so available in Canada rather. So the, uh, the this is called, the first one is TIIV. That is the trivalent inactivated vaccine. We don't offer that in Manitoba. We offer instead the QIIV, which is the quadrivalent inactivated vaccine. So that covers you against two A strains and two B strains. And that's a, what's called a standard dose. Um, there's also an adjuvanted uh, QIIV, all right, at a high dose TIIV, and, a li and the, as I mentioned, the live, the live attenuated vaccine, which is which is not offered. So high dose, what is what is high dose TIIV? All right, so high dose TIIV is the high dose flu vaccine, and I know Peggy's going to talk about uh, her experience with this as as uh, going forward. So Manitoba was the first province to offer high dose inactivated trivalent vaccine. It's current in, in, across Canada. It's currently being offered to those 65 plus in long-term care facilities, all right, as part of the provincial program. It is available by prescription for those over 65 from their physician or, or healthcare provider. The, the, um, the question often comes up, um, well, why isn't it offered as part of the provincial program, for example? And it very well may be at some point. Uh, the the, the um, uh, level of scrutiny that a new vaccine go, has to go through before it gets uh, input into a, a provincial program it, it is quite substantial. And that both the National Advisory Committee on Immunization and the American Advisory Committee on Immunization say this about the high dose vaccine. So they say at the programmatic level, our Canadian recommendations that any of the four influenza vaccines, all right, that I mentioned should be used. So the standard dose TIV, the high dose TIV, the adjuvanted TIV, and QIV should be offered. And this is where it gets interesting. High dose TIV is expected to provide superior protection compared to standard dose TIV. So the, however, there's insufficient evidence to make a comparative recommendation on the use of these vaccines at the population level. At the individual level though, our National Advisory Committee recommends that high-dose TIV should be offered over standard-dose TIV to those 65 years of age and older. NASI concludes that given the burden of illness associated with influenza A, like the H3N2 virus that we had last year, and the good evidence of better efficacy compared to standard dose in this age group, this should be offered. All right. And then they talk about some of the other uh, vaccines. ASIP, which is the American um, uh, um, counterpart to NASI, says we're going to continue to review the data on the efficacy and the effectiveness of these vaccines as more information emerges. No preference is expressed for any one of the vaccine types. So for persons age 65 or years of age or older, any age appropriate inactivated vaccine are acceptable options. So the the last point I want to make uh, before we, we we move to any questions, because it's such a fascinating area, has to do with, you know, what so what does it all mean? All right. In, there are different vaccines that are available. Uh, we know that they're safe and effective. We know that there may be certain preparations that are more effective than others, given this certain virus that's circulating in any given year. But the, the best flu shot for you is the one you get. So we've got 55% of our population over 65 covered. That leaves a tremendous amount of work for us to do to increase that level. It's never gonna be 100%, but it certainly could be 65 or 70%. Um, all vaccines available for use in Canada are safe and effective. Each vaccine has strengths and weaknesses. And at this point, the science and the evidence is still evolving. So there's no clear winner yet. Uh, but I expect that if I was lucky enough to come back and talk to you in, a, in another year or two years, then, we, you know, I'll be able to answer that question more definitively. I think at that point, if, if we're okay time-wise here, I'll Wait for questions and answers. Jim, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hilderman. Uh, looking at uh, the screen here and uh, wanting to entertain any questions that uh, any of our listeners may have, 
And uh, while we are waiting for some questions to come in, I've, I've got a question for uh, uh, Dr. Hilderman. And we, we've heard the term flu season. Yes. Uh, what is the flu season in Manitoba? And when should people be getting their vaccination to prevent the flu virus? Is it ever too late to get a flu shot? Excellent questions. Thanks, Jim. Those are great questions. I'll make a mental note to put that, include that in the presentation for, for a future. But flu season typically starts in Canada uh, in October, and uh, it typically is over by March, April. Uh, the peak of influenza vaccine, of influenza disease can occur any time between October and March. So, for example, this year, our, uh, we, we think we've just passed the peak now in late January, early February. Um, and uh, last year, we had a peak right around Christmas. Um, th but there are also the potential for multiple peaks throughout the year. And so to answer your, your, your second question, which is, is it ever too late to get the flu shot? Any time within that flu season, it's never too late. So whether you do that, in, ideally, we want you immunized in October, early November. Um, and uh, but if you haven't had a flu shot, because peaks can occur at any time in that flu season before March, April, um, we, we would also recommend that you be immunized. Thanks, Jim. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Hilderman. Uh, so now I'm going to uh, introduce you to our next presenter, uh, Peggy Prendergast. And Peggy uh, is a mother of three and a grandmother of seven young adults, all who live in Winnipeg. As an artist, retired teacher and lover of music, she is interested in having Winnipeg a place where her children and grandchildren will enjoy the rich cultural life that is pre presently available to her. She is also very involved and interested in helping to ensure services necessary for full participation in an active lifestyle are available to the growing population of older adults in Manitoba. This includes the health services that are related to the changing developmental needs of Manitobans across their life course. Vaccination for various developmental needs change as people age. New research findings to assist in the healthy aging process are always being discovered and Peggy strongly believes they should be available to all when proven effective. So thank you for joining us today, Peggy, and I'd like to ask you now to please share your story. Thanks very much for the opportunity, Jim. My story is pretty brief, but it, but it was, it was, pretty um, exciting might be the word but it was pretty scary as well so last year on December the 6th 2017 I fell in my kitchen and broke my hip and was taken um, to the emergency surgery uh, hospital which was Seven Oaks and there I received the, the partial hip, re hip replacement. So the following four days after the surgery saw me up and walking with a walker and with help from a physiotherapist and her assistants. I accepted the offer of rehab so I could go home and manage by myself with minor home care when I got there. This was a much different hospital experience than ever I had experienced before. Cutbacks in physio and occupational therapy allowed for minimal support or help. The most frightening experience, however, was with the flu epidemic that was happening coincidentally in the city. People being admitted with orthopedic emergencies were also infected or carriers of the flu strain prevalent last year or contacted in hospital. Some had even had the regular flu shot but were over the age of 65 and it was not enough to protect them with their diminishing level of immunity because of their age. And this was one of the factors that um, influenced me in choosing to have the high dose flu shot at one point during the following 10 days, I was told by staff that I was the only patient in a pod of 20 that did not have the flu. There were times when I was doing my regular walks 
that was part of my therapy, th that there were patients in recliners in the hallway gasping for breath and with terrible rasping coughs. I had never heard people, and I mean heard, people so sick. The nurse on duty was able to keep closer watch of them this way, but the air was full of their, ger their flu germs. Why did I not get the flu? I had heard about the high-dose flu shot that was being administered to patients in long-term care facilities free of charge that were over 65 years of age. I'm approximately 20 years older than that. I believed the whole business of the level of immunity being less as you age. And although it was not free to me and not too accessible, I believe it literally saved my life last year. I work with elderly seniors and I am one myself with a chronic condition, I have a heart condition, that warranted me paying the $85 to have this shot. My shot this year has come down to $70. But I had no idea I would fall and be in hospital at the height of the flu season, but because I had the shot, I was protected. So in my mind, I was a pretty low risk, and it was, um, however, it, I have other reasons for believing in vaccination. I have two children in their 50s that have worn hearing aids uh, since they were very young, because there was no vaccine when they were infants and could not, in terms of chickenpox, they had chickenpox everywhere. And that's what the doctor believes was the cause of their nerve damage that requires them to wear hearing aids. And so um, I like the life I live. And uh, I know I'm a high-risk um, older adult, so I believe in the vaccination and the flu shot. But I do uh, so associate with other older adults that don't think that, they, that, that the risk is worth taking, that they don't need to spend the money. And I guess from my own experience, it is that I, I believe in this flu shot. Thanks for the opportunity, Jim. Thank you very much, Peggy, uh, for your personal account and your experience uh, with getting the high dose uh, flu zone uh, shot to protect yourself from influenza. Uh, right now, I'd like to uh, uh, respond to some of the questions that have come in uh, and we have one question that has uh, come in from Kim uh, at Concordia Place and she'd be interested in uh, is interested in this presentation uh, for educating their staff. Uh, absolutely uh, in terms of uh, sharing this information uh, this webinar actually will be accessible on the uh, Wellness Institute website uh, as well as uh, our Active Aging in Manitoba website. So uh, if you were not able to uh, tune in today, uh, you'll have an opportunity to, uh, to make that happen. And I'm just uh, seeing if there's any other questions coming our way for our, our uh, pre presenters. And uh, again, uh, people are asking uh, for the slides, uh, for the information, uh, which will again be uh, accessible uh, throughout, uh, like from this point forward. Okay, then uh, if that uh, concludes our, our questions uh, for today, I uh, just, uh, uh, indicate too that for further information about active aging in Manitoba you could visit our website at www.activeagingmanitoba.ca uh, to find out uh, about uh, other opportunities uh, for healthy active aging uh, in our province. We hope you enjoyed the session and found it informative and helpful. This webinar has been recorded as I mentioned and you will be sent the link. 
If you'd like to watch it again or share it with a friend, we encourage you to do so. Before we conclude today, I would like to encourage you to participate in the upcoming Wellness Institute webinar entitled Plantar Fasciitis, a pain in the foot, uh, which is happening on Tuesday, March 5th at 12 noon. And this will be facilitated by Wellness Institute physiotherapist, Carrie St. George. Plantar fasciitis is one of the most common types of heel pain. In this upcoming webinar, you will learn about the causes of plantar fasciitis and, a, and different types of treatment, including some tips on self-treatment. Hope you can join us for that one too. Now, I will leave you with some thoughts. Uh, when we talk about uh, evidence and we talk about uh, uh, the information and choices that people make and decisions that they make, it is important to make your vision broader than your view. So stay informed. And make informed decisions about your health and please be that person that your dog thinks you are. Thanks for uh, listening in and goodbye.